After the release of Empire Strikes Back, a new dashing rogue was introduced into the Star Wars universe, one who was very different from Han Solo and to part of the audience, provided them someone who looked like them on screen to represent them. I, of course, refer to Lando Calrissian. Thus, it is not particularly surprising that Lando got his own trilogy of novels, some which were thematically different from the, Le from the Han Solo adventure novels, and also a series which had a more cohesive narrative to them than Han Solo's trilogy. Unfortunately, not that much is known as to what was going on behind the scenes of this book. Al Neil Smith is very much alive, but there aren't many interviews or articles going on out there discussing what, was, what happened behind the scenes of these books. Now, what some research shows is that Al Neil Smith was, in science fiction circles, or at least writing in publication circles, relatively unknown at the time. He'd gotten a couple books published, but that's pretty much it. At the time, he was, and well, still is, a very major libertarian, with most, if not all, of his works having pronounced libertarian subject matter, but with perhaps the sole exception of the Lando Calrissian series, and with Smith being a very active member of the Libertarian Party since the year after it was founded, to this day. This is somewhat notable because, as I mentioned briefly, Smith's libertarian themes that pervade hit the entirety of his work are almost completely absent or at least pushed so heavily to the back burner as to be not noticeable. This may be to a degree why there aren't that many interviews about the books with Smith. That whether due to creative differences between Lucasfilm and Smith, or due to a general sentiment by Smith that he doesn't feel that the books are representative of the body of his work, he hasn't really talked about them in the writing of them very much. As with the Han Solo Adventures, we have three different books which mostly stand alone, with the significant difference that all three books share a common antagonist, and each book builds somewhat off of the previous book in the series. The first book, Lando Calrissian and the Mind Harp of Sharu, begins with Lando winning the Falcon in a game of Savic. We'll get back to that later, along with the cargo of life crystals and a droid of alien manufacturer named Vufi Ra, awaiting pickup in the Rifa system. Lando goes to pick them up, only to get roped into a scheme by the Imperial governor of the system and a sorcerer of Tund, known as Rokor Gepta, to find a long-lost artifact of the original inhabitants of the system, the Sharu, specifically their Mind Harp, which possesses great power. However, on finding the Mind Harp, Lando discovers that the current native inhabitants of the system, the Mo, are actually the Sharu. They repress their intelligence in order to save themselves from an alien race that feeds on other intelligent starfaring races, in the hopes that this would keep them away. The Mind Harp would unlock the Sharu's intelligence and restore their home world to their to its former glory. Lando activates it and leaves the Rafa system with a hold full of life crystals leaving a pissed-off and empty-handed Rokor Gepta behind him. In the second book, Lando Calrissian and the Flame Wind of Ossian, Lando and Vufi Ra, having lost much of the cast from their last score due to various operating costs, 
have traveled to the Ocean system, where the rich and elite go on vacation in order to make some of that money back in games of Sabic. However, after Lando kills an assassin who is sent after him with a prohibited weapon, that's Lando with the prohibited weapon, not the assassin, though the assassin's weapon is probably also prohibited, Lando finds himself roped into a sting operation against one of the system's most well-off inhabitants. The inhabitant in question, whose name I'm going to mangle, Bohua Mutda, every year receives a shipment of Lesai, or Isai, I'm not sure which is the proper pronunciation, which is basically space heroin during the titular flame winds, a solar event which engulfs most of the system and which looks stunning, which is why the elite go here on vacation. But it's also a massive hazard to navigation. Lando, with two Imperial police officers on board, must reach Mutta and do the exchange so Mutta can be arrested. Meanwhile, Rokor Gepta has his own schemes in motion against Lando. In the final book, Lando Calrissian and the Star Cave of Thon Boca, Lando and Buffy Ra go to help out what can be best described as a group, as a race of hyper-intelligent space whales known as the Oswaft, and save them from predation from the Empire, while once again taking on Gipta, who is out to kill Lando once and for all through his force of Imperial warships and independent pirates. Lando, as a figure in these books, is much closer to Cary Grant than Humphrey Bogart. Lando is, as in the Marvel comics, a figure who carries a blaster, who is not afraid to use it, but prefers to exhaust all of their options before drawing it, preferring to talk his way through problems and conflicts instead, and even then, once he's drawn the blaster, he's still willing to talk before he pulls the trigger. Additionally, while Lando has a wide variety of hustles he tries through the series, he first and foremost tries to be a legit businessman. If going legit fails, he falls back on gambling, and if that fails, he goes for a big score. Further, the better angels of Lando's na nature can overcome his greed and his desire to not get involved if pressed, as we see in the case of the Oswaft. And also we see this, of course, later in the films themselves, with Lando's involvement in the Rebel Alliance and the New Republic military, both in the main trilogy and then later on in the later expanded universe. Probably the largest contribution this series adds to the Star Wars canon is the introduction of Sabic. Sabic, in brief, is a card game that I compare to Mahjong, except played with cards instead of tiles. Players have a variety of cards in their hand which they hide from their opponent, and there is a selection of cards on the table laying face up. These cards have a variety of point values, with the player needing to get the highest possible highest amount of points to win, but with some hand combinations having higher values than others, or higher rankings than others. Players exchange cards over the course of the game with those cards visible in the middle of the table. However, the cards that are visible in the middle of the table can change values randomly. So there is a risk-reward situation where pulling a wanted card too early can give too much info on your hand, but drawing too late can mean your needed card has become something else entirely. The other major addition is the Sorcerers of Tund. Not because the Sorcerers themselves can, uh, come up again in a big way, they don't. But instead, it introduces the concept of other Force-using traditions aside from the Jedi, or for that matter, the Sith, which we will see again later, and not even that far off, in the form of the Night Sisters. With the Oswaft, we also see the other major space fauna in the Star Wars universe, aside from the space slug. Additionally, the Oswaft poop gemstones, which allows the Star Cave of Funboka story to become a, another major score for Lando. Finally, there is Rooker Gepta. Gepta is part of a race of alien mollusks who can make force projections that make them look like full-sized humanoids. Clearly a case where Smith was taking Yoda's remark of Judge me by my size, will you? to heart. While this book takes place in the Empire, its presence is very much in the periphery. We only see a few Imperial officers and ships over the course of the series. 
primarily through Gepta's small task force, and there's very little mention of the Empire itself or Gepta's involvement with the Empire or the Emperor. The series starts as strongly as the Han Solo Adventures series did, but it doesn't finish nearly as strongly. The middle installment of this trilogy is too narratively cluttered, being a rat's nest of plot threads, with Gepta having his own task force while also manipulating a group of pirates who are against the Empire into attacking Lando because they think Vufi Ra was responsible for the enslavement of their world by the Empire, along with a whole bunch of other things. And in the Star Cave of Thrawn Boca, while parts of it are certainly enjoyable and has good moments, Lando disappears from the story entirely for a very large stretch, making it very frustrating to read. The Han Solo Adventures series really fares better in terms of its narrative, its characterization, and its pacing. Next time, we will finish off our discussion of the Expanded Universe as contemporaneous with the original films, as we take a look at the final part of Marvel's original run of Star Wars comics. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time. <laughs>